Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I am excited to be here with two restaurateurs from Singapore. Um, they've come to discuss what it means to reopen um, in an environment marred with heightened sensitivity and concerns over the outbreak and pandemic um, and the economic uncertainty and what it's looked like since they've reopened. So the panel members today will discuss their experiences for navigating the operating challenges of the environment now and share how they've opened and operated in the last several months in a uh, COVID world, especially specifically in Singapore. Um, so today joining us, we have Ivan uh, Bram, chef owner of Nori and Appetite Restaurants in Singapore, focused on fine dining and, and curated experiences who undertook a shift in service style um, to adapt a more takeaway and delivery model at the very beginning of lockdown um, in Singapore. And then also Travis Mazzero, Mazzero? sorry, um, a, a Cornell Hotel alum from 03. Um, he is the founder and owner of the Travis Mazzero uh, Restaurant Group. Um, and he also pivoted to a takeaway and delivery model in Singapore in response to the quarantine. So I wanna thank you both so much for being with us today, especially so late in the day in Asia. Um, I know that you both actually had to be at the restaurants today and, and uh, were some were more successful in getting home before <laughs> than others. Um, but I really wanna maximize our time together, uh, especially since it's so late in the day. So let's, let's get um, started right away. Um, you know, I, I think the first thing that would be really great to give everyone a context about is uh, what's the state of affairs in Singapore for you what how's life and how's restaurants uh how are restaurants surviving in singapore ivan ivan you can start yeah but it's been a, a pretty incredible time actually I, I, we were discussing this on the off channel there it hasn't been this good in a while in singapore i think we have a, a bubble a utopia of sorts at the moment a lot of revenge dining as we call it people who have been on lockdown for quite some time have now the opportunity to go out and go out to eat and uh, go out to drink. Uh, and because of some of the constraints, they're maximizing and packing all of that intense activity in the space of a few hours. So it's really busy, very busy services with a lot of spending, um, spending power. And it's been a pretty fruitful time. Great for us to recover from, obviously, the, the downtime of Circuit Breaker. Uh, but uh, it's been a, a pretty interesting and uh, electrifying time. Uh, we are waiting for this bubble to burst. I think there is a, an apprehension in the in the air. Uh, we don't exactly know what the next day is going to bring. Uh, and so uh, for us, at least, I don't know about you, Travis, but we're trying to make the most out of this phase uh, to ward off the, the future, the uncertain future. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, during that two-and-a-half-month period when we were um, you know, in lockdown, essentially, and we had to, to pivot to some other models. I think, you know, people now really appreciate the time that they have to get out. And yeah, there's a number of measures that everyone has to fo follow and comply with. But I think everyone just feels a sense of, um, you know, of, of just uh, being able to, to dine with friends and, and go out and have a good time. And, and, you know, that's been such an amazing uh, sort of moment for us as restaurateurs, you know, to be in the city and you know, with no tourists, essentially, and just, you know, the people who live here to come and uh, support our businesses. Um, and uh, we've seen an incredible support, as Ivan was mentioned earlier. Um, I think, you know, this rivals, and I've been in Singapore close to 15 years, this rivals any of the greatest uh, periods that I've experienced in terms of business. So, um, you know, I'm a little bit more optimistic about what happens after the travel um, ban gets lifted and we can all sort of move about. But, um, you know, certainly there's going to be um, you, you know, not a burst of a bubble, but I think uh, some deflation in the market and we'll all sort of come back to a, a relative normal um, situation. But uh, it is indeed uh, a wonderful time to be here um, in terms of just being able to run our businesses. As we know, many restaurateurs around the world are not able to run their, their businesses and um, have had to do some incredibly uh, difficult things. And, uh, you know, we're just happy to be open and, and to be serving people. That's incredible. I think it's wonderful that, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity to be optimistic and and for a lot of uh, particularly U.S.-based restaurateurs for something to potentially look forward to, this idea of revenge dining when people feel comfortable going back out to dine. Um, I, I, I think because of where a lot of our audience might be in America, it'd be really helpful to know a little bit about 
you know, what happened at the beginning of lockdown when you had to shift your service model so that they can kind of see a little bit of where you were? Because obviously um, the lockdown and COVID all was a much bigger issue in Asia to begin with than before it hit the U.S. So, you know, for both of your restaurant groups, you had to focus on, you know, you, you focused originally on in-person dining. So it became impossible during the early days of the lockdown. And, you, you know, the word of the year seems to be pivot. So, you know, obviously before Singapore opened the uh, restaurants on June 19th um, and, you know, had that restricted service, what was it like for you to pivot your models? What did it look like and how did it go? Travis, do you? Yeah, I'll I'll jump in. I mean, I think, you know, at the beginning, um, it was kind of like one of those things that you knew was going to happen, but you didn't, you just didn't want to recognize the reality in front of you. And so when they announced that restaurants were going to have to close and and only do delivery or takeaway, um, it was, a, it was a really strong moment. I think probably the strongest moment I've had in business where I had to really um, put, get myself together and be like, okay, we have a business. We have to keep everybody employed. We you know, are going to do whatever we can to keep the doors open for people to come in and uh, serve them uh, in terms of, of delivery or takeaway. Um, and we had some struggles. I mean, we have four restaurants in our group and two of them happen to be pizza shops and Um, You know, for that, we're super thankful because that business was really kind of already set up for something like this. You know, we did delivery prior. You know, it's a very casual sort of mid-priced option for people. So, you know, I think that business was in some ways uh, a blessing in disguise because we really didn't have to do much. We didn't have to put a lot of energy into trying to restructure it or figure out technology needs or any of those things. So that was kind of on autopilot. And then our two high-end restaurants, which are essentially identical, they both serve the same menus. We found that only one of them could sustain an operation serving that menu to the city. There just wasn't enough demand to keep both locations. So we decided to, to take one of the, of the businesses and really just focus on being creative. You know, for so long, we, um, you know, we, we, as you know, day-to-day running restaurants, it's kind of a, you know, it's a grind, but it's a consistent sort of grind. And, um, you know, you don't often find yourself with few hours here and there to really be creative unless you're Ivan, who that's what he does for a living is be super creative. But for us, you know, our businesses are pretty structured and pretty straightforward. And so uh, it really gave us an opportunity to do some interesting things. And, you know, from those, you know, we've did a number of projects. We did a sort of whole roasted chicken for families uh, on the weekends. And we, we made English muffins uh, during the weekdays and, um, you, you know, sort of like focused in on comfort food, things that we thought people would, you know, would, would sort of, you know, be attracted to. Um, and it didn't make us any money, um, but <laughs> it did give us, it, no, it just gave the team a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of like, you know, hey, we can do these other things. We can do, you know, stuff that we thought about that we didn't before think that as a business we were set up to handle. Um, and we learned so much. And I think, uh, you know, I'm sure I've been, has similar sentiments, but I will say that our team came out of this so much closer and so much better prepared to work together than they were before. So for that, we are super thankful. That's incredible and wonderful to hear, you know, what, what the, the positives of this otherwise very, you know, calamitous event globally has been able to provide for us, right? It's really important to look at the silver lining. Ivan, how was the pivot for you and how was, how was the initial stages? Because I know that you do a lot of very fine dining um, as, as your concepts. Yeah, we, we had to really look at ourselves and, and uh, assess if we were if we thought or we had the confidence to take everything that we were doing to somebody's home. Uh, first, as a chef, I had to kind of overcome the the bias of, of sending people food home. You know, as a fine dining chef, you you spend so much time trying to craft things and but make them look absolutely beautiful and pristine and control the temperature and the delivery of everything, and so. Takeaway was never an option for us, and suddenly we had to face that. I, the, for us, the catalyst was realizing that everywhere else around you was just about to implode. Like, we could see the wave coming, and I remember sitting sitting with the team and saying, like, we're going to just use this opportunity to try as many crazy and wacky ideas as we could. There was literally no stupid ideas. We, we grabbed everybody and said, let's try everything provided that it's in line with our concept and we don't feel like we're betraying who we are, we were going to do everything in the books. And we did. Like, we tried a 
And as Travis mentioned, seldomly did these make money, these initiatives, but we we did uh, collaborations with a, a, a dim sum place that you go at 3 a.m. when you're drunk. You know, we, had, we served people dim sums in little dim sum baskets. We did a collaboration with a pasta artisan, with a home cook. We work with a cheese artisan. Uh, we kind of pivot all the vegetables that we were using in uh, uh, from our farm. We have a farm in Cameron Highlands in Malaysia, a partner farm. We essentially uh, transform them into vegetable boxes and deliver to people's homes. And uh, when we realized that all of this would make no economic sense, it, and it was not really sustainable because of commissions on delivery, because of uh, commissions from platforms like uh, Uber Eats and Grab and things like this, we decided to convert a portion of our staff to logistics and delivery drivers. And, and it was what ended up saving a lot of jobs was the opportunity for us to actually get some people who really we had no need to at specific times. I don't know if you know this, but Singapore curbed the amount of staff initially that we could keep in the, inside a restaurant. And we had a good amount of people here. And at some point in time, we saw ourselves with the allowance for eight staff. And so we took a lot of our team and, and put them remote and got them uh, taking care of logistics and delivery. Two of our chef de parties did delivery for a couple of months. They essentially know all our regulars now. Uh, they judged everybody's homes. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it worked out. And I wouldn't say we, we were making money, but we managed to survive because we were fast to respond. Uh, and uh, I must say the reason why it worked uh, coherently was because we also pivoted digitally. We had a platform digitally. I, I had enough time and resource with my team to work on a web a website and to launch something that, that operated as our sales platform. And uh, we learned a ton. It was a phenomenal time, even though uh, it was crazy, it was a phenomenal time as a restaurateur. I, I don't think uh, I saw it as a negative space. It was a, a pretty interesting time to be alive. So what's interesting, um, you know, I'd love to know a little bit more about the technology piece. You mentioned uh, Uber Eats and, and Grab, which for, you know, those who are not familiar with um, Asia, Grab is one of the delivery options um, that are available there. So if you could just talk a little bit more about the technology piece that you, you developed, that would be, I think, really interesting because I know there was a lot of um, conversation in the U.S. about what these fees are for places like Uber Eats and then in the U.S. DoorDash or Seamless and things like that. Yeah, Uber Eats is not really in Singapore. I use the example because I know it's very prevalent in the U.S., but Grab is the equivalent here and a couple of other platforms. And while they did contribute lowering their fees and extending free, uh, free months, essentially, we, we had the opportunity to say no to all of that and do this door-to-door -door in a very analog kind of way. I think in some regards, there was a fear of not having the systems to be able to operate, but... Uh, once we realize that the systems have to start with a piece of pen and paper, like that's how we started. And that became an Excel spreadsheet, and the Excel spreadsheet became uh, a Shopify platform. Uh, and we, what we didn't have as far as uh, technological resources, we compensated with labor. We had staff available. So I had enough people to throw people at a problem and come up with a solution. And, and that helped a lot. There was a lot of polemic here in regards to the extortionate, uh, well, let's say, fees that some of these, plat more, these platforms uh, charge. Uh, and very quickly, Russian tours realized, well, that they didn't need to subscribe to that model, that there were other alternatives there. And so people started to branch out in a much more grassroots kind of way, which for us is also one of the key points of all of this. I think things that managed to... Uh, Initiatives that manage to be very rooted in the community, that manage to bring things closer to like people, people to people interactions, they seem to be a lot more sustainable in these times of crisis. You know, uh, when you have to have meetings with a tech company that comes in, installs a system that charges you this much, uh, when you can contact the cab driver that one day you took the telephone for and also needs the business and say, hey, how about ten of your friends help me deliver food? for these next few months, it actually worked and it was very fast to set up, you know. And so I think instead of going big business, we went uh, grassroots and, and that helped. 
That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We're in the business of people, right? And so leaning into that makes a lot of sense. Travis, what about you? You know, you have four restaurants and you were saying, you know, with the pizza delivery and things, how did you find that your, you know, operation changed maybe with technology or just those kinds of areas? Yeah, I think likewise, as Ivan was talking about, you know, we um, were partners with a lot of those already uh, set up delivery companies. And, you know, we quickly realized as well, and our restaurants are maybe similar to Ivan's in the sense that it's a very analog experience. You know, we, even when we have pizza restaurants, we really are a restaurant where people have to come to, to understand what we do and, and sort of appreciate the experience. And so, what we tried to figure out was how we could create the relationship with a person. So when somebody, you know, orders a pizza on an app, we don't know who they are, where they live, have they been to the restaurant before? It's not in our database. So we sort of, you know, I guess re-engineered it and said, okay, if I'm sending pizza to your house, I'm going to put a little note in the bag that says, Hey, thank you so much for ordering pizza from us. If you would like to do it in the future, please uh, send us a WhatsApp at this number uh, and we'll give you 10% off your next pizza and, you know, an extra cookie or something. And so this helped us to create a relationship with the guest that was direct. Now we could talk to them um, through WhatsApp and so on. And then from that point, we then figured out, as Ivan was explaining, how to manage the logistics instead of getting a Grab or an Uber Eats involved. We, again, would contract with taxi drivers or we would find, um, a, you know, another company who was able, like a limousine services from the airports needed a lot of business. So we contracted with those people. Um, they charged us a small fee. We told the guests, listen, we, we need to charge you a small fee for the delivery, but we can assure you that it's going to get there at exactly the time that you want it and exactly the temperature because we're managing the logistics. And so this was something that I thought was very useful to us because now we are doing most of our um you know, anybody that takes away pizza from the restaurant, 90% of that is from actual physical people coming to the restaurant to get it um, because they appreciate, you know, the service and, and the level of quality at that point. Um, but we still get people to do the delivery services. But I think what it's done is it really helped to create a strong uh, customer following and base for us. And obviously we kept all the information instead of giving it away to a lot of the delivery services. So, you know, I think as, as Ivan knows, like our businesses are based around people. It's always about relationships, no matter what. Um, and I'm, I was so struck by the fact that as soon as we locked down, the number of people that contacted us directly tried to figure out, okay, can I send them an email? Can we send them, uh, you know, WhatsApp or, or a text message? was incredible. And I think those are the people that we really have worked really hard now to make sure that we recognize on a consistent basis. You know, we, we are very uh, mindful of the fact that these are the people that continue to um, make our businesses successful. So I think, you know, taking it, you know, just not looking at it as a profit driver or, you know, trying to figure out how to sell the most of something through a delivery app. It's really nice to sort of look at it from the other side and think how you can re-engineer it to help your business when things get back out of the lockdown and you can create these stronger relationships with people. These are ingenious. I mean, I love this. You know, obviously Singapore is a, a, a very small place, very concentrated place, but I think that there are some really great ideas and some creative solutions that you both have found to help your business, help your community, and then support other businesses surrounding you and your, and, you know, kind of honor your relationship with your guests and your purveyors. So this is amazing. We have some questions from the audience that I think are really topical. So that I'd love to ask you guys. Uh, we have a question from Ruben. What was your communication and marketing strategy for reopening? Um, I guess I'll, I'll start with you, Ivan. Uh, we went to, uh straight to Instagram and uh, EDMs, essentially sending a direct mail list to our guests. Uh, we have a very close connection with our guests through reservation systems, and we use WhatsApp here a lot. And so quite a lot of these messages were direct to guests by myself and the team uh, and straight into social media. Uh, and that, because of the interesting case of Singapore and the amount of uh, interest in dining out at that particular time, we were a bit overwhelmed uh, without knowing too much what, what we were to expect. We were quite overwhelmed with the response. People were very quick to respond to reservations. And they're booking way ahead of time as well. And so uh, the marketing it wasn't that much of a, a challenge for us. And I think anybody that's coming out of a lockdown period, 
we'll probably face that. If you already had a loyal following or we're, we're in the process of developing that loyal following, uh, you just need to tell your guests you're open and that you're ready to receive them uh, and that you're taking precautions to ensure that we're going to take care of them in this interesting uh, uh, COVID time, which is what we did. We were very clear. It was like, we're open. Doors are open. Limited availability because of social distancing norms. Uh, explain what the guidelines were, and that was it. There wasn't a lot of need for uh, crazy marketing outreach. Uh, but I, I repeat this again. I think our target is always to start closer to us, mm -hmm. uh, not think of like the global, um, but to think of the neighborhood, you know, and start in that in that radius. So when we did that with, for example, Facebook, our targeted Facebook ads would always be related to specific demographics we knew already were very intense patrons of ours. So we first targeted our closer family and then started to branch out for uh, the expansion that was necessary. I think the WhatsApp thing is a really interesting um, opportunity in Asia and around the world that maybe is not as common in the U.S. because I think a lot of guests are not necessarily accustomed or are comfortable with the idea of text messaging with their restaurant. Um, you know, in that way. So that's kind of interesting. I certainly know that when I'm in Asia, it's not unusual to make reservations via text um, and just texting, you know, the, the, the restaurant's number. But I think that that's not as common in the U.S. So that that's an interesting cultural uh, shift that may not translate as well to the U.S. I mean, what about you, Travis? Did you have, um, you know, you have a lot of, of, of property. So how did you communicate the opening and, and the, the pivot to delivery? Yeah, I mean, I'm um, our company and myself, um, you know, to be very frank with you, we're not very digitally savvy. Um, and, and we didn't have, uh, you know, we're, he was talking about Facebook ads. I, I swear to you, I still don't understand what a Facebook <laughs> ad is or how to place it. Uh, but I will say that when, when we locked down, one of the first things I thought to myself was we had a, a fairly uh, large uh, Instagram following. Uh, and I would post very sporadically, and I'm the one who manages it. Listen, it's it's there's no like sort of rhyme or reason to things. I would just post things here and there. But I said to myself, okay, I think one of the things that I can do as an owner, or the, at least the the sort of face of a business, is to be visible. So I started um, on the first day of lockdown. I created a series called Tasting with Travis. Our restaurants are, are mostly centered around wine, um, e even with our pizza restaurant and our, our fine dining restaurants. And so every night I would sit down for five or six minutes, I would pour a glass of wine, I would just talk. And it really helped to create visibility for the business um, in the sense that when everyone was locked down, you know, more people were on IG watching things and, and, and you know, discovering new places. And it sort of created for me a, a little opportunity to speak to people directly, which I never really thought about. And so over the over the course, I think I did 72 episodes, which is every day over the circuit breaker. You know, we would have things like I would do the English muffins and I would say, hey, you know, at the end of the show, we just released these amazing English muffins. You know, the first, you know, 20 people tomorrow uh, who order them um, will get, you know, a special deal or whatever. And it was just like, you know, that was the only way we marketed um, and really, you know, showcase what we were doing at our restaurants was through the IG accounts. And it was so, so rewarding for us. And, you know, um, I would say for people in the restaurant business uh, who are listening to this, you know, it doesn't always have to be, you know, you don't have marketing and, and sort of communications always you know, feels like you have to sell something to somebody. But just being visible, being, uh, I think, accessible uh, in your communications is really important. And it was always a way for me to really kind of, um, just be there in case someone wanted to, you know, send me a message or, you know, we could communicate through IG or whatever. So it was really, it was really a, a wonderful experience. I think this is incredible. You know, I think the takeaway that we both we were, I'm hearing from both of you is that you really kind of became uh, a lot more entrenched in your own communities and, and acknowledging those guests that have helped you and, and for strengthening those bonds with your guests. This is I think, you know, I think sometimes through all of this, we forget about the importance of guests interactions and we're so focused on just keeping the business alive, but we forget that the guests are the business, right? Like those relationships yeah. are the business. Um, so I have another question very quickly, uh, both about costs. One is about how you manage your food and beverage costs before and after lockdown. And then the other question is, of course, what percentage did your payroll increase spending increase? 
So I think that's really important. And it's important to note that food and beverage costs in Singapore is a little different than the U.S. because Singapore doesn't grow anything. Um, so they have to import everything, to my knowledge. And correct me if I'm wrong. But so, um, you know, maybe whoever might want to talk about the food and beverage cost or somebody else might want to talk about the, the payroll spending. Travis, do you mind I'll if I haven't talked about, about food? Yeah, absolutely, man. I was going to say. The food and beverage cost. The, I think for us, the the it, it was clear also that to continue buying the type of products that we were buying, I guess a, a Miyazaki Wagyu tenderloin to serve at, uh, at dinner makes sense here in the restaurant, but the cost was somewhat prohibitive for people that needed solutions for lunch and dinner on a constant basis at home. Uh, what we did was literally hit every supplier that we knew of in town and say, look, what do you have in volume that is of good quality, a product that we would be proud to serve in our restaurant? But instead of being maybe a primary cut was a secondary cut, instead of being 30, 30 months old, be 16 months old. Uh, and we started to essentially start to shift the menu around so that uh, the food became slightly more casual and could accommodate also this, this slight uh, decrease in perception, I guess. Uh, with it came more accessible prices, and so we managed to keep our IP, I guess, keep our, our guts as far as our food was concerned, and with that soul still there, still deliver a product that was competitive, and so our, our food cost actually didn't change. It went down. It decreased. It didn't increase. Uh, it was a little difficult for us to realize how to put all that into a, a nice P&L being uh, we were producing also items that weren't necessarily dishes. You know, we were making sauces, jar jams, jars, preserves, and things like this. And so they had an impact that kind of swayed our perception as far as cost was concerned. Uh, and also selling other people's products, people we like, uh, friends of ours, people who are making chili sauce. And so all of that had an impact too. But overall, I think this idea of working closely with suppliers, because ultimately these products that were perhaps sitting there uh, and were being used by maybe uh, middle-tier restaurants uh, that weren't going to be used anymore because these places were going through similar processes that we were going, needed a place to go, and so we took them, and that helped a lot. Um, the, the question was about, um, about staff costs, and I think, you know, for the American audience there, what you, um, you should understand a little bit about Singapore is there's one major difference um, in that most um, staff here in Asia, I, would, I, I think I can qualify that, but uh, are paid salaries. So you don't have the hourly staff that you might have in America would make up much of your, your payroll. And so, you know, when um, the government, you know, told everyone that they were locking down, they also came out with support for restaurants. So their um, function was to say, we want to make sure that you do not lay anybody off. So we are going to subsidize up to 70, I think it was 75% of all of your local staff's payroll. So I know that if I was in America today and the government said, we're going to, we're going to subsidize 75% of all restaurant staff payroll for the next three months. I mean, there, there might be uh, there might be, you know, uh, uh, parties in the streets all over America, <laughs> but um, you know, in Singapore, that was the, you know, the government support in that measure really helped us say, okay, let's really do our part as business owners and employers to make sure that um, our staffs are really well looked after. And then also the fact that the foreign staff that we have did not benefit from, from this uh, support from the government. So we had to really, you know, you, you still have to try and run the business to support the rest of the costs that you have coming in. Um, and there were some creative ways that we dealt with that, you know, by uh, trying to clear as much leave and holiday that the staff had built up over periods of time. That's sometimes very difficult to clear at the end of the year. So we tried to make that a priority. Um, you know, we also took this time to cross train all of our staff. So instead of, you know, a, a server who, uh, you, you know, maybe joined us six months or a year ago, we now um, we're training that person to uh, run our bar. So that was, you know, that's usually a three month dedicated training. We could get through that now in uh, three to four weeks every day for that person over the period of time that we were closed. So when we reopened, everybody was kind of, you know, ready to go and had uh, more skills and uh, talents than they had before. So, you know, w it's hard to, uh, I think, give a, a response here that sort of can satiate the American 
um, idea of what labor cost is because it's a completely different system here. Um, you know, everyone is on salary. Everybody gets, uh, you know, up to two, three weeks of, of, of holiday every year. Um, you know, there's uh, the differences in the ter- in terms of hourly pay and, uh, you know, part timers that, that exist in, in America is uh, it's a completely different situation. So I think that's so important. And, you know, I, I think it's, it, it leads to a really interesting conversation about how the government and obviously there's a lot of, of, of conversation around this can better support small independent restaurants and small businesses across the U.S., but it's something that, you know, maybe it gives us a model as to what we can ask from our, our, our government, right? And so that's great. And for context, both Travis and Ivan have worked in or, or, or are just from the U.S., so they understand what it's like to work in American restaurants. You know, Travis, as I mentioned, is a hotel alum, and Ivan's worked in New York, and I know that you've lived here for a long time, too, so there's a lot of there's a lot of understanding of the American restaurant scene and culture and the way that the businesses are run. So they, they are very sympathetic. So continue to ask those questions. But I, w- if, I love if I this. Could just quickly add to, add to what was just said. I think one thing we also noticed is the community mobilized. There was a, a, a really uh, proactive coming together of chefs, restaurateurs, and F&B practitioners to demand change, you know, and I think the government was also caught a little bit unprepared and quite a lot of the victories that that the industry uh, managed to acquire were a result of that mobilization. So people did come together uh, to ask for stuff, to say when things didn't work, you know, if proposals weren't good, uh, how to improve them. There was a lot of backwards and forwards between the industry and the government to try to come up with solutions. That's incredible to know, and I think that that's something that we're st- we, we see in the U.S., but maybe uh, a good lesson to learn. Um, but, you know, on this topic of, of, of staff and guests, I'd love to know, you know, you've mentioned a little bit about reservations and guests and things like that. We've had some additional questions, but with guests and staff, how do you keep staff motivated? How do you keep them disciplined about the COVID policies, and how do you keep them uh, you know, protected from maybe uh, staff, guests who are not as interested in adhering to certain guidelines. Travis? Yeah, I can speak to this because we, um, you know, anytime you mix, uh, you know, alcohol with, um, with, with, you know, going out and, and, you know, people, you know, lose their judgments and, and can become a little bit, um, a little bit difficult to handle. But, you know, at the first, the first couple of weeks, everyone was, it was a bit of a challenge, you know, uh, to get everyone on the same page. The guests were sort of like figuring out how far they could push, you know, staff was like, can I really say this to somebody where before you probably couldn't have had that conversation, like a a hard no, you know, we don't usually try and say no to our guests, but in these cases it was like, absolutely not. You know, we, we, this cannot happen. And, you know, it was a very firm, no, no, no sort of flexibility in some of the, the ways that things had to be done. Um, but I think over time, certainly now, uh, I think everybody understands what's happening. And the government has used various ways to show us they'll take certain circumstances, put it in the paper the next day, make a, a big scene of, you know, uh, something that happened at a restaurant and that restaurant got shut down for 20 days. And the people that, you know, didn't comply with some of the rules got fined or had their, you know, work passes taken away or, you know, were deported or, or whatever the case. So there are these little moments where the government's like, we're just going to show you what happens if things don't go certain ways. And um, yeah, this is a little heavy handed for sure, but it is, it does kind of um, keep everybody um, I think a little bit sharper in terms of how they react and how they act in establishments. And, you know, now if, you know, just for reference here for everybody listening in America, if you enter a restaurant today in Singapore the first thing is you have to sign in to a uh, contact tracing uh, application on your phone. So checking into the establishment. Second, you have to have your temperature taken. And third, you have to wear your mask uh, at all times um, unless you're eating or drinking, of course. So if you had to get up to go to the restroom, you have to put on your mask and go to the restroom. You can't intermingle with tables. Uh, You can't go over and say hello to a friend. Um, that you might see across the room and and start having conversations and sitting down and having a drink with them. All of that stuff is totally off limits. And, uh, you know, as restaurateurs, we have to be careful because these are our guests. But at the same time, uh, we have to tell them 100 percent, 
this is not allowed. Unfortunately, you know, you have to move back to your table or so on and so forth. And um, so that's how we really had to deal with it. And, you know, for the most part, I think everyone has uh, played their part. And, you know, we're all able to operate and have a fairly normal business situation for the last three months, which I can't say is uh, the case for many people in the world. Absolutely. Ivan, do you think that the guests have responded well to the shifts in, in, in policies as well for you? I think there are always uh, both sides of the story. A lot of guests are very good to deal with and uh, easy to interact. Some guests quite difficult, and a lot of people are looking for cracks to, to try to make two reservations with uh, five. If they can't book a table of eight, they'll try to book two tables under different names, and you find out in the middle of a meal that they actually know each other. And so we have to figure out how to circumnavigate those problems. But overall, I think most people uh, rather err on the side of caution, guests and staff alike. And people don't want to be made an example, and, and Singapore does tend to do that to keep the order. You know, they will be very quick. I think within the first week of uh, rations being open, now there's a 10:30 drinking rule. You have to stop consuming alcohol at 10:30 in the dots. So if there's a glass of wine in front of you, the ration can be fined or closed. And within a week of being being open, uh, two outlets on my street uh, were shut and had to pay an enormous fine. I think ten thousand dollars was the fine, uh, and the picture stamp of of uh, the actual enforcer was uh, ten thirty one for one restaurant and ten thirty two for the other restaurant. So they were sending very clear signs uh, as to the rules of engagement. And I think on the staff side of things, we. Uh, the first way I've found to keep staff motivated is to be motivated yourself. I think if they notice that you're very stressed about what's to come, they will also internalize that stress. And I think I, I did a good job at keeping the spirits up by just being completely wacky and going at it one day at a time and saying, like, hey, we're in this together. Nobody has any clue what's going on, but we're going to do our best. And so we try to be as loud and, and uh, excitable and excited as we could. And that seemed to uh, keep the momentum going for a while. I must say, it has been very, and I see in their faces now, people are very tired. They are emotionally tired. It's a lot of curveballs. Being, being a restaurateur, being a chef, being a waiter, these are jobs that require a lot, of, a lot of your skills, not just the physical strenuous skill of just being on your foot all, all day long on your feet all day long, but also emotional, psychological skills, right? And these, these wear out after a while, and I've noticed uh, within the last maybe four weeks or so that uh, people are, like, needing a little break. And so okay. we're going to do that when the year closes. We're all going to throw a massive party, maybe burn some stuff and see what happens. <laughs> not too massive, of course. No, not too massive. Um, so one of the, the – relating to what you just said about reservations, we had a question from Kelly – she says, all my locals want to eat at the same time, and I try to stagger the bookings, but it's so hard to say no to them or not give them the exact time that they want. Do you have any advice? Um, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, well, yeah listen, I, I mean, this is a very uh, difficult subject for, for, for some restaurants. You know, of course, you, you want to take care of your regular guests. You want to be very mindful of, uh, you know, the people that support you and try and do whatever you can to assist. You know, for me, we always we always try and work on the verbiage that we speak to our guests. You know, if someone wants a 7.30 reservation, we say, you know, oh, I'm so sorry, but that table's, um, you know, not going to be available right then, but I can get you in at 8. Uh, if you want to come to the bar earlier and have a drink, you know, we'll, we'll get you comfortable. And, you know, there's a way to, like, you know, not tell them no, but also at the same time provide a solution for them. Say, yeah, 8 o'clock is fine, you know, like we can do that. Um, but... Uh, you know, I think now because everything is condensed, we have, I think Ivan mentioned earlier, we all close at 1030 now. That's the sort of uh, last call hour. So we, um, and in diners understand, like, if you want to go to Ivan's restaurant, um, the demand for restaurants like his is so high that, you know, he, he can say, you know, listen, we have, uh, we have a seating at five o'clock or 530 uh, or we have a seating at 830 or nine o'clock. Um, if you really want to dine here, we can get you in on either side of this uh, equation. If, if you're willing to make a, you know, a few, um, um, you, you know, uh, trying to come in a little bit early. Uh, but, you know, listen, at the end of the day, you ha this is part of managing your business. You can't let guests manage your business. So from a restaurant's perspective, 
you have to be quite firm about, listen, I have a table at six and I have a table at eight, but you can't let people say, oh, I want the table at seven or 7.30. And you know that you only are going to be able to turn that table once tonight where you could have turned it twice if you said, hey, listen, all I have is six and all I have is eight, right? Because then you, you know you can get two seatings out of that. I mean, that's part of our business and part of figuring out your restaurant's, you know, demand and flow. And um, But uh, I think our guests now are very aware of the fact that I think, I don't know about you, Ivan, but we send a message once they make a reservation. It's a long, detailed text message about all the different things. And part of it is, you know, we reserve your table for two hours. That's a comfortable time to enjoy your experience with us. Um, you, you know, and, and then after the two hours, uh, we would politely ask you um, to recognize that we do have a, a subsequent reservation for that table. So just to kind of preempt the fact that it's coming, um, you know, to let people know that it's not where you can just hang out all day or all night long. Um, you know, because we're all trying to make a, we're all trying to figure this out. Like before we could, you know, I was open till midnight, um, still serving. So, you know, now that I don't have that hour and a half, I still have to figure out how to, to create the same amount of revenue. So. And I think, so on the topic of revenue, I even, um, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I think and just to, to uh, speak directly to that question as well. I think telling them that you can't because of COVID is okay. Like using COVID, I wouldn't say as an excuse, but we're all going through a massive hurdle. And uh, just just because we want does is not good enough anymore. Like there are also adaptations that people have to be willing to make. And I've noticed that when I go through this route and I speak to guests and say, look, unfortunately, we can't because of this. You know, we just that uh, we need to recoup cash because we almost closed two months ago. People are like, oh, yeah, oh, my God, I didn't even realize uh, and so that conversation is okay to be had, you know, for you to tell people like, look, because of these bits, you don't have to uh, cry, cry a river, but uh, explain, explain why, and you can manage the expectation that way. I think you know, and this it, it's this continuing the thread that I, I'm hearing from both of you. It's lean into the community and trust the community, and be a little transparent with your community to know to explain to them like. This is what we're going through and we're going to do the best we can, but if you could help us in some way while we pivot, either with other small businesses in your community and your guests, I think that's a big part of it, that conversation. Um, so I, I, you know, there's some more questions I want to get to, but there's also some other things I want to ask you about. This is a big thing for me in my mind, and I know that we talked about this briefly before we started the webinar, um, and it is a little unique that Singapore has had this, as you mentioned, revenge dining, where people are so enthusiastic to just be out of their homes um, that they were going out a lot. But both of you, um, Ivan, you've already opened this uh, new location during all of this, this COVID-ness, and uh, Travis, you're in the process of opening a place as well. So, you know, um, I guess I have to ask, are you crazy? Uh, <laughs> I mean, Ivan, you've already opened, so maybe share a little bit of your experience. But we were caught completely off guard with Circuit Breaker. We were already about 80% done with refurb for Appetite, and uh, we were literally, uh, hope the week that Circuit Breaker kicked in was the week we were going to soft opening. I had already hired most of my staff. We had already brought a substantial amount of wine stock and food stock, and so we were gun to open, and uh, I think for me, there was no option. Uh, it was really like, the project's done, let's just go through it, you know. And to be frank, we had felt in, in, the, in the space of F&B, the need also for spaces that were a bit more intimate with less capacity that uh, were able to cater a more experiential kind of interaction with guests and people were able to stay for longer, chat for longer, connect with... with uh, what they were eating and, and uh, the servers, the chefs. So when we devise appetite, the whole the whole space was based on these uh, intimate, smaller interactions, and so we didn't lose that much when when Circuit Breaker ended. The restrictions for for dining applied, uh, but social distancing here meant we lost maybe twenty percent of our seats, uh, and that wasn't in the end a, a big deal. You know, we managed to recoup that with other initiatives. Uh, I think there was already that tendency in the environment pre-COVID. Some people noticed it. I think Russian groups that kind of uh, started to change from larger outlets and heavy foot traffic areas uh, to smaller kind of operations uh, did the right thing on time. These were uh, proper uh, business decisions there. I think one thing that the, the circuit breaker moment 
taught me was that businesses that were already moribund perished. They, they didn't survive. If you had a, a side of your operation that was not sustainable, uh, either in the produce type of thing, you were going to be affected. If you're dealing with mass market stuff, there would be shortages you wouldn't be able to address. It. If the lack of sustainability was with staff, you weren't going to have staff to get you through the period. If you weren't sustainable anywhere, uh, it, it really it kind of accentuated that crack. And so when we opened Appetite, we really thought, like, look, if we were to do this correctly and not think about, like, profiting tons, but having a business that is that can survive, you know, and thrive progressively, um, how would we do it? And that's how we took this challenge. Travis, I mean, you're you're opening soon, and you know, yeah. so you you obviously what made what what were the decision factors for you to continue with this opening? Uh, well, so one of the things that I um, I think I'm lucky is that I've been in Singapore for a while. I've seen a few events. I I came to Singapore in 2005, and it was just I think that was a year and a half, two years after SARS. Um, and uh, the restaurant scene then in Singapore was sort of rebounding and, and doing incredibly well. And then I also opened a restaurant in, um, in 2009, just as the financial crisis was, uh, was overtaking the world. Um, and again, there was a lot of despair and, and concern in the world about whether or not businesses would be able to survive. And again, the restaurant that I, uh, that I was a part of um, did incredibly well. And I think that's where my optimism comes through today is that I look at what's happening and I know this will end. I think we all know that it will come to an end at some point, at least um, to a manageable end. And I remain optimistic. And during these times, and, and, and I even mentioned there's restaurants that are not going to make it. There's restaurants that uh, are going to close. And, uh, you know, for me as a, as from the business side of things, I love opportunity because we like to create sustainable long-term businesses and now with the amount of spaces and, and, and I, we talk about Singapore being booming and restaurants are great and, you know, people are out and dining. There are a significant number of restaurants that are not doing well and a, place, a lot of places who have closed. So there's a tremendous amount of real estate on the market. And, you know, for me, I also understood there's leverage. You know, now when the landlord, uh, when we have that conversation, it's very different today than it was 12 months ago. Um, and so I try to you know, work with uh, some of the, you know, people in the past of that with the landlords of my, my current buildings. And some of the things I asked for that I, that I thought would never, ever be able to get in a lease deal. Um, they were like, okay, no problem. So on and so forth. And so that was really the impetus for me to say, okay, this is an opportunity right now. Now I understand it looks totally crazy from the outside. Um, but the way that the, the, the deals are structured, create, uh, you know, uh, situations for me that allow me to, you know, have cash flow that don't allow that, uh, that create, you know, five, 10 year leases on buildings that I would never have an opportunity to do that in the past. So that's kind of where, you know, um, it all kind of came together for me. We had a concept that we were thinking about doing, um, you know, a few, a few uh, years ago that we sort of, um, just have never been able to find the right space and pull the trigger. And so we found the space, it came up, I was like, let's do it. My team was super excited. Um, and you know, one of the things that I also want to say is, I don't think I told you this before we, um, before we started this is that one of our restaurants is in or was in, um, a department store on one of the busiest shopping roads in Singapore called Orchard Road. Um, and, um, just about a month ago, we got the news that the department store went bankrupt. Um, and they entered liquidation and unfortunately we're a byproduct of this, but we are, we were licensed our space that we had in the store through them. Um, and now we're essentially being thrown out. So, uh, next week will be our last service at, uh, at one of our flagship restaurants, which we never expected to happen and really is no fault of our own. But the circumstances and the way that, uh, you know, the whole thing was set up, unfortunately, um, you know, this has come to bear. And hey, listen, we're lucky now. We can take our staff from there and move them to our new restaurant. So we're blessed in that sense. But, um, you know, when we look back, and you know, we're very happy that we made the decision to want to open. But, um, you know, these types of things can happen to anybody and it can happen to good businesses. And, um, you, you know, so you just have to, I think in our business, you have to be agile you have to be ready to adapt and you have to be able to take circumstances that appear dire and try and find out what you can do to make them positive. So, 
that's where we're going. And uh, we're super excited to open our new Mexican uh, restaurant here in a few weeks. And I know a, a number of Singaporean residents that are very excited for some Mexican food in Singapore as well. So um, I have, I think, you know, a few more questions. And I think, you know, this is a great segue into the next part, which is, so, you know, we've, uh, we've heard from both of you some really ingenious things that you've done to sus keep the business sustainable and through all of this at the beginning of lockdown and all of this, um, you know, the meal kits and, and the, uh, the perhaps not particularly profitable, but community building uh, projects that you've worked on. So what do you think post COVID when all of this is over, what will you maintain? What operational changes, what staff shifts or cultural changes within your organizations do you think you'll keep? You know, um, we had a question about, you know, whether or not you think that contactless payment will sustain in Singapore. And, you know, another person asked about whether or not you'd still have delivery. And, you know, what other, what, what things do you think you'll stick, will stick for you? I think uh, for us, maintaining the idea of product development on a platform, being able to sell products that aren't necessarily food dishes but are uh, reflective of what we do, uh, that's a very good way to uh, supplement income. Uh, also, we did a lot of collaborations in the past with visiting guest chefs, and uh, when traveling resumes, I think to extend some of those dishes as delivery options in events. We're a very small restaurant. We can only sit about 26 guests, and so... Maybe we could send some of that food to people. I think I'm a little less skeptical now of delivery, now that we've managed to see that it is possible, and a little less arrogant as well. If the intention was to always uh, connect to a guest in our restaurant in an intimate and a good personal, personable way, we're able to do that in a very incredible way in the person's home now. and That's, a, 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 I think, a good uh, shift in my mentality. Uh, and pairing this digital integration part, you know, being able to have a restaurant that also operates online in some regard and does some sort of, of uh, training there. This is something that will for sure stay. Travis, what about you? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll echo that our store has continued to remain online. And, um, you know, we, we do limited uh, delivery from our high-end restaurants, but it, it's, uh, I think it's very focused. It's much better now than it was when we first started, so that will continue. And it allows people to order directly uh, through the portal, um, and it's a seamless experience. And we tried to create that experience that was very similar to the restaurant in terms of easeability to use. Um, I think the contactless payments, uh, you know, the options and, and sort of the different methods that people can use now to pay has been incredible for us. Uh, in fact, that was really concerned when we started the pandemic, when this whole thing started, how we were going to be able to facilitate payments. But, um, you know, whether it's bank transfers or we have a thing in Singapore called Pay Now and uh, all of these apps that you can just pay on, you know, pay right away. And it's it's been really remarkable and seamless. So those will continue to stay with us uh, through all of this. And, um, you know, I think... Uh, you know, the digital integration is going to continue as well. Maybe not with other outside companies. I think within our company, we're going to really try and uh, to develop that ourselves and, and, and try and link that to our CRM system so that we can really tr try to cultivate more of a community within our businesses from our, from our guests and, and link them all together. Um, but uh, definitely, you know, the, uh, the store will, will stay and, and we'll continue to do that. I, I mean, we only have five more minutes left, and this has been tremendously interesting. I loved hearing about the ingenious partnerships you've come up with. These are certainly some new ideas that I've never heard anyone else come up with. So um, I think there's just one specific question um, about the government of Singapore and what they've done to support restaurants. So you mentioned that they help supplement some of the staff uh, salaries and things like that. Did you also, as um, restaurant owners and business owners, kind of get re receive any governmental support? And uh, if you could disclose what that looked like, that would, I think that'd be really interesting for a lot of Americans as they continue to talk to their local uh, government leaders and ask for something that might be helpful for them. I was like, let's ahead, do I... this one together. You can you can help me out as well. I there were. Yeah. Supports for uh, staff up to 70% initially, and those decreased progressively. Now, when Circuit Breaker ended, there was an incentive from the government that any new staff that was hired would be on a 30% supplement as well. Uh, moving forward, there were uh, tax breaks uh, for property owners that were uh, intent intended to trickle down to the actual tenants. 
And so those, uh, do you remember what was the what was the percentage there, Travis? Um, uh, of the property tax. Property tax. tax. Yeah. Well, the property tax ended up being um, essentially one full month of free rent for for most restaurants. That's ex- that's essentially one of the ways they were able to um, get landlords to facilitate the rent relief, which ended up being for most of us four months of rent free during this period, um, which I think is unprecedented and probably something that uh, you know we honestly um, I think that was probably the biggest help in terms of just letting us continue to operate uh, without having to worry about that aspect of our business. They made a number of other um, moves in the government themselves, like landlords could no longer, you know, forcibly remove you from your premises for not paying rent. So they put a lot of these protections in for for business owners that, you know, really would kind of cut down on some of these predatory landlords who were, who were used to using the iron fist to get their way. Um, and so there was a lot of, uh, you know, sort of, I guess, support from the government in that sense for for businesses. Um, just just like, hey, listen, let's get through this together. Let's get to October. You know, nothing. You, the landlords couldn't do anything to you if you had to dispute about rental or, or whatever the case may be. Um, there was a uh, tribunal set up to help you. Um, uh, you know, sort of moderate those and, and, and go to an outside um, um, somebody to help you, you know, sort those things out. So there's there's tons of these examples. There was some, you know, there's a lot of digital incentives. So if you spend yep. X amount on, um, you know, becoming more digital, the government will support you. I don't know the percentages, but uh, I've been my... And educational, my, my educational grants as well some the the tech support sometimes is just a cash payout depending on the type of platform you adopted or hardware that you bought sometimes they were up to 50 percent so online we've just opened uh, an online gallery viewing room and workshop and master class kind of space within our website for appetite and that was 50 percent sponsored by the singapore government so it allowed us to to take the master class and workshop environment digital uh, because of that. Uh, also, there were grants for education. So if you were going to be re-educated, retrained, uh, the government supported up to 80%, if I'm not mistaken, of people's salaries, depending on the type of courses that you would take, for the hours that you attended the course. So uh, a lot of businesses uh, within uh, the group that I am a part of actually sent uh, half of their staff, instead of clearing leaves, to attend courses on everything from like uh, business management to proper etiquette to cake decorating. And they managed to uh, retrain their staff and at the same time uh, pay for their salaries and not have to lay people, uh, lay people off. Uh, It is, I think talking about that particular part in in the context of Singapore, I'm often talking to this about friends abroad and I'm sure Travis also does that. But I think, the, the one lesson from COVID is also to respond to your, like, immediate kind of experience, right? We've been a very global uh, world for a while, and we're consistently looking at what everybody else around the world is doing. But the realities now with COVID have become quite localized. Like, we're talking about problems that affect the community that we're talking about community again, but that affect this community that's a bit more narrow and closer to you. And so that we can try to emulate specific things that are more generic, but in reality, I think Travis hit the nail on the head when he said it was a lot more about the agility with which you approach the not knowing, that you approach the the doubt in that moment and and turn that into an opportunity. It's a lot more about that than specific solutions because every state in the U.S., for example, will have a a different way of approaching uh, the problem. And uh, trying to mitigate a, a one-size-fits-all solution is, isn't necessarily the best way forward. So m- my big advice in that context is to respond quick, like Travis said, uh, and consider these that are problems for who you used to be, uh, opportunities for who you can be uh, moving forward. Well said. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. That was so good. So, so we, we've rehearsed it. <laughs> We only have about a minute left, and I think that that is actually a great note to kind of wrap up on. And, you know, we've obviously covered topics about community, about leaning into your guests and your staff. Um, Obviously, governmental support has been fundamental in supporting all of these initiatives. And and as part of that, you know, communicating your needs to the government and knowing that that's an ongoing dialogue. 
But also, and I think that this is a really great one, it's about the agility and trusting in yourself that you've weathered challenging times before, right? Like Travis said, whether it was with SARS or the financial crisis, or if it's just about, you know, like, listen, we've already got this underway and we're going to trust ourselves, like Ivan said, and open a, a, our space. Um, I think it's about that. So uh, I think that's pretty much all the time we have for today, but thank you both so much. Um, I got a ton of questions that we were able to cover, so I appreciate that. Um, and thank you all for viewing. Um, I hope you were able to uh, find today helpful and uh Hopefully we'll we'll have an update in a few months about how well things are going in Singapore and in the US. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you Be so safe, much. Thanks everyone. Take care.